Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have a situation where the entire global economy seems to be in intensive care units, so I think it's just fitting that we have a very strong session on healthcare and how to nurse everybody back to good shape. We have a terrific panel over here. We have two ministers, leading corporation heads, domestic and international. The idea is to talk about how India is looking at healthcare. The broad themes are very simple. India has to take care of its own people. How can it innovate to make sure that cheap healthcare and cheap medicines are available for everybody? And India is a center for innovation which can help the globe and other countries, poor countries across the world, get better healthcare and better medicines. So without much ado, I'd like to introduce and ask Mr. Kapil Sibyl to make his introductory remarks. And we'll be asking all the panelists to make a few remarks on what they see is the future uh, for India in healthcare and innovation. And then, of course, we'll take a lot of questions from the floor. May I invite Mr. Sibyl? Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, wonderful to be here. Um, I don't think that we should be uh, so pessimistic uh, as, as, uh, as you're making it out to be. I think uh, in, in times of stress, uh, we have great opportunities ahead of us, especially in the healthcare sector. Um, even in the meltdown, I think that the global community has responded extremely positively. I mean, you couldn't have seen this kind of response way back in the 30s um, when the economy is busted then. So I don't think that we should be pessimistic. We should use this as an opportunity to move forward and to collaborate with each other. I think when you talk about Indian healthcare, I think you shouldn't forget that it's part of a, a global effort. Uh, you need to think about it globally, not just, uh, not, not that India needs to think globally, but the global community should, should think of India as part of the global community and then address issues of healthcare. I think that's the first point I wish to make. Number two, you, you talked about cheap medicine. I think that's inappropriate. Uh, what we should be talking about is affordable drugs. Uh, affordable drugs, but um, um, not compromising on quality. So we should look at two standards, standards of excellence and affordability. And remember, affordability will vary from country to country. So we need to uh, have a global architecture of healthcare which, uh, which targets affordability across the world, depending on the economy we are serving, and at the same time, does not compromise on levels of excellence. Okay, those are, because every consumer in the world, especially in healthcare, wants uh, the least expensive drug uh, without compromising quality. Now, how do you achieve that? That's the big question. If you look at manufacturing, drug discovery, manufacturing in the Western world, I don't think that uh, the, 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 the formula or the, or the strategy of the Western world in the context of healthcare has succeeded. We need to actually move away from that because I don't think that companies globally, uh, especially the big multinational companies, can, can produce uh, quality drugs at affordable prices, uh, which countries, which people in India or this part of the world can afford. Uh, the kind of healthcare costs that these economies have to suffer as they move forward because um, almost 70% of the costs are paid by the state. Between 10 to 30% are, are costs paid by, by the private individual, depending on which country you're in. And I don't think economies in the world can afford it, especially in the context of the meltdown that we're talking about. So that experiment doesn't seem to have succeeded. Uh, but in India, you have a situation where we can actually, with a low-cost economy and a high-quality human resource place, we can actually manufacture a drug to achieve those levels of excellence and quality, and yet make them affordable. So I think what the global community should be looking at is looking at economies which have three factors present. One, high quality human resource. Two, a low cost economy, right? And three, the necessary infrastructure and manufacturing capability. Uh, now, if any economy has these three, these three things that are prevalent, then I think that's the country that can deliver, not just for India, but for the rest of the world. Uh, and I have always said that there are three areas in which the global community must move forward together. 
One is finance, the other is clean technologies in the context of global warming and climate change, and third is healthcare. And I think that we need to look at a different paradigm, a different formula for healthcare. In India, for example, 80% of our healthcare is in private hands, and we're a young population. Uh, if you look at investments in the healthcare sector uh, for diseases that, Im that impact our part of the world, from 1975 to today, only 1.4% of all drugs have been produced for this part of the world. All the drugs have been produced for consumers who can afford those expensive drugs. So there's an enormous market, there's an enormous opportunity. The question is, how do you use that opportunity to trade to, to not just solve the problems of healthcare in India, but actually use India as a springboard to access the rest of the world. Uh, we need to increase our investments here. It's 1% of GDP at the moment. We need to increase that to 2 to 3%. Uh, that's fundamental. We need public-private partnerships. Uh, that's absolutely necessary. We need the state to act, actually give land free uh, to healthcare facilities and use that as a basis for equity in the healthcare system. Uh, we need partnerships to develop high quality human resource uh, in India, because I, we have enormous uh, uh, young population, about 50 crores or um, are, are, are below 25 years of age. Uh, so we can use that human resource uh, for serving in the Indian healthcare system, as well as uh, accessing uh, global markets and serving the global markets. Thank you. Thank you. May I invite uh um, thank you very much. And can I first of all say what a genuine pleasure it is to share uh, the stage with such a distinguished panel and to be speaking uh, both at a CII and World Economic Forum event. As we can see behind us, the uh, phrase that best captures the role of the World Economic Forum is committed to improving the state of the world. And if ever there was a time when that purpose was needed, that time is now. Not only are we facing very significant global financial turbulence, but we are just seven years away from the timescale that global leaders set for fulfilling the promises they made back in 2000, the Millennium Development Goals. And if you look at the Millennium Development Goals on which the world is most off track, there is no doubt that health features very prominently. And that's why I welcome the fact that health issues are a subject of such live debate, not simply in my own country in the United Kingdom, where it forms an ongoing part of our political debate and discussion, but here in India, as we've just heard, but also featured so prominently in the recent presidential election in the United States. This is a challenge which all countries in a globalizing world are struggling with, and in that sense, I think this conversation is both timely and appropriate. I first met Kiran, one of our fellow panelists, I think seven years ago in Bangalore, and it would be fair for me to begin my brief contribution today by paying tribute to the really extraordinary progress that we've seen from Indian Pharma in those intervening years. Uh, already, the Indian pharmaceutical industry is a global presence, and I think the real opportunity of today's discussion is to focus on how that global presence can be set to work for global public goods. I know that the World Economic Forum is planning a further meeting on the business call to action, the work that private sector companies can play in achievement of the Millennium Development Goals this coming January in Davos. And I think this discussion is a foretaste of the kind of discussions we will have there. Of course, the description of today's discussion, moving from um, imitators to innovators, I think captures the move up the value chain that is already significantly underway within Indian pharmaceuticals, but is a process that will inevitably continue. That move up the value chain to innovation is greatly needed if we are to rise to those global poverty challenges of which I spoke. Malaria still kills more than two million people in our world every year, and HIV uh, affects 33 million people uh, living with uh, the virus each and every year. In India, those figures translated mean that we've got about two and a half million people uh, presently HIV positive and two million cases of malaria. So in that sense, I do think there is more work that together we need to do in exactly the kind of public-private partnerships of which we've heard. And private sector innovation has an absolutely key role to play here. 
I think one task is to incentivize and to find ways to encourage the private sector to step up to the plate in finding more affordable medicines uh, and new forms of medicines and vaccines for these diseases. Uh, that's why we in the United Kingdom have uh, placed such stock on the advanced market commitment to try and make sure, uh, particularly in relation to pneumococcal vaccines, uh, that we provide a guaranteed price whereby we can see uh, the drugs being distributed far more widely than they would otherwise be at that point within their development. So I think in terms of the advanced market commitment, we're already looking ahead to see how we can move it beyond the sectors in which we've worked previously, for example, in terms of malaria, and we want to see more done beyond the pneumococcal work which we've started. The second area where I think we can make some significant innovations is in the area of public-private partnerships that we've just heard about. I earlier today announced a very exciting partnership between the United Kingdom government and the Clinton Foundation, which will take the opportunity in the area of HIV and AIDS and also in the area of malaria to see what we can do over the next three years again to make available uh, much more widely affordable medicines for both of those killer diseases. I think that's but the latest example of where we need imaginative thinking, not simply within the research laboratories, but also within the corridors of public policy to make sure that we both recognize the scale of the need that exists at a global level, recognizes the commercial opportunities that exist, and recognize that if we get that delicate but vital interaction between the private and the public sector right, we can actually go a long way to addressing those needs. Thank you. Uh, may I have one minute? How would, how would you see this? Well, I think, you know, uh, it's really a matter of definition of how you define an innovator and an imitator. I think today most people uh, would look at the Indian pharmaceutical industry as an imitator because we make branded and generic pharmaceutical products. And they look at big pharma companies as innovators <coughs> because they're looking at developing NCEs. But I think let me uh, look at it slightly differently and tell you why I believe that India is very much on track on the innovative side. And I'll, sh <coughs> I'll, sh I'll share that with two or three specific examples. Uh, one, uh, as Mr. Kapil Sibal had mentioned, that you know, India has played a very significant role, at least from the pharmaceutical industry, in terms of developing HIV AIDS products, looking at developing cures for treatments like malaria, which are issues of Latin America, of sub-Saharan Africa primarily, <coughs> and of India. Uh, no big pharma company for the last many decades has really focused to develop new chemical entities and cures for these diseases, and the reason for that is very simple. It's not economically viable. And I think there is an opportunity which Ranbaxy identified long time ago and was committed to developing a new cure for malaria. And for the last three decades, we haven't had a new NCE. But we took on that initiative, and we've been developing a new, uh, a new cure for malaria. And today, we are ready to start phase three clinical trials. And hopefully, if everything continues to progress well, we will have a new NCE by the end of 2011 for malaria, which will benefit people around the world, and especially it will be provided at extremely affordable prices. So there will be innovation. I think India will be put on the global map of bringing out a first NCE globally, and that too at an affordable price, which will save millions of lives, as both the ministers have just mentioned. The second example is, I think, a very a very important and a very active role that the Indian pharmaceutical industry as a whole has played in the area of HIV AIDS. If you go back in time of, say, seven to eight years, I think we are all aware that HIV AIDS products were available at tens of thousands of dollars to people in developed markets and also in developing and, and underdeveloped countries, and really there was not adequate access and affordable access to these high-quality products. This is once again where the Indian industry has leveraged our strengths in chemistry, in research and development, in manufacturing, and provided these products at a fraction of its price to people. Today, <coughs> these same products are available at maybe $30 or $40 per annum versus the ten dollars to $15,000 per annum that they were available. This, to me, is innovation where we are able to leverage our skills, our capabilities, 
to provide these products to people and impact and save their lives. I think the Indian industry has also been innovative where we've developed different cocktails of products on first line therapy, on second line therapies, and then again provide these benefits to the people across the world. So I think these are two very significant areas where I think the Indian pharmaceutical industry has been extremely innovative. We, on our own across many companies in India, have our own uh, NCE programs. There are collaborations, there are strategic partnerships. There have been a bunch of out licensing activities. So I think India is very much on its way of moving up the value chain on the innovation side and, and really leveraging the strengths that we, that we have in India, which I think many, many companies around the world would want to cooperate, partner, and work with Indian companies like, like Jubilant, like Biocon, and many, many other companies. So I certainly believe we are very much on a path. Uh, Indian enterprise by nature is entrepreneurial, is innovative, and to me, innovation goes far beyond just developing a product. It's about the way you work, it's about the way you think, about the business models. And for that, I'd like to share an example. I think what Daiichi Sankyo and Ranbaxi have done uh, in terms of coming together and creating a new business model for the future where we are combining the strengths of a, of a global innovator and yet at the same point in time of a company like Ranbaxi that, that comes from an emerging market which has strong capabilities globally in branded generics and also the potential to develop innovative products on discovery and development side for the first time, I think, uh, two independent companies are coming together and creating a new model for the future. As Mr. Kapil Sibyl was saying, I think clearly there is, there is need and necessity for big pharmaceutical companies to leverage strength of companies from emerging markets. And at the same point in time, there are huge opportunities for companies like Ranbaxi out of India to leverage strengths of big pharmaceutical companies. So to me, this is an innovative model that we are both committed to doing. And I certainly believe that over the next many years, we have a fairly aggressive plan set out for ourselves, which will ensure that we're able to provide a more holistic set of products across the value chain to people around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tamir, specific question to you. How do you see India as a stage for innovation? And what role do you see for both the private sector and the government in accelerating that? Now, uh, let, me, let me try and put it in a slightly different uh, context. I, I agree with most of what you said, but um, there is something um, about innovation that is truly global, that uh, you can't nationalize innovation. And, you, and particularly, you can't predict where it comes from, what combinations you need to make. Uh, which institutions need to work with, who makes the breakthrough, where does it come from. And uh, I think it is very dangerous to think about innovation uh, in a purely national sense. What you can do is to think about the drivers towards innovation in a national sense. India, for there is no doubt, there is no doubt that India in the future will be a driver of innovation, not because of the beginnings of the industry it has, innovative industry it has, but because of its market and its market needs. You know, with modern medicine, we have been treating globally maybe a billion people in the last 50 years. Between Europe, United States, North America, Japan, Australia, about a billion people. India will grow to a billion two by 2011, 2012. If you think about uh, innovation in a, in a medical sense, in a drug sense, medicine sense, it can easily take 10, 15, 20 years before you become successful. And it is unpredictable on that route. If we project forward the needs of the Indian market, 10, 20, 25 years, we project forward the economy of India over that period of time, the demand for modern medicine, uh, the will develop over this period of time at an incredible rate, at a rate that we have never been able to serve, have never had to serve in the past. So the task now is to figure out, among all of us, companies in India, companies in Europe, companies and institutions throughout the world, what are the things that we can do, that we can develop, what are the innovations that work, 
in India from a billion to people, as many people as we enabled to be served in this other very fragmented world. This is a very different moment. The US and the European pharmaceutical markets are very saturated. They're very clocked up. They're still full of needs, too, because people still have Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, cancer, all kinds of other things. And we need to solve those, too. And we need to work on those as well. But they're very clocked up markets. India is at a big new beginning at this moment. It is organizing itself. It's finding its way. I've been three or four days here now. I met uh, people uh, in all kinds of different ways, um, not in this room, but outside this room, working on uh, the educational component, working on the innovative component, working on the component to set up partnerships and ideas that work where people come together to get to an endpoint. And that is the beauty, because we're all working towards the same goal, and that's to get a patient treatment. This afternoon, I signed for my own company, a and, and, and partnership with ICGB on uh, malaria. Now, Genzyme cannot solve malaria by itself, but maybe we can make a contribution. In this partnership, we will try to make a contribution. That's all uh, we can say. Making a contribution, we have to if we can. Uh, that deserves, that allows you to earn your place uh, in a society, and we all have to do that. But making the contribution that allows us to figure out the right way to bring innovation to treat patients uh, in India, that is what uh, we still have to work on very hard. Can gene therapies, for instance, in a very uh, beautiful way help in this world differently than it may apply in Europe. Uh, there are many different other ways we can think about true leapfrog uh, innovations that are particularly applicable uh, to a market with the unique characteristics of India over the next 25 years. Thank you. May I bring in Munich Mazumdar Shaw? You've been one of the leading innovators uh, in India. Now, a question which arises is when a company based in India begins innovation, what is the genesis of it? Do you look at a market? Do you look at a product? Do you look at a need? Is it geography oriented or is it a need oriented beginning? Well, you know, uh, if you look at innovation per se, the what really drives the innovation ethos in our organization is the fact that I truly believe that today we are challenged with affordable innovation. And to me, India offers a very interesting ecosystem to do that. And you can't do it alone. I think I want to just pick up from what Henry just said. I think the seed of innovation can be born anywhere in the world. And I think what is going to emerge in the future are interesting partnering models. How do you do what is best done in each region to deliver that affordable innovation? I think things have to change from how they have innovated in the past. I think the Western world has innovated in a very vertically integrated way in the past in the West. That is not working anymore. Today, of, you know, innovation is expensive. Innovation is not able to deliver affordable drugs to patients all over the world. They are therefore addressing a very small population restricted to Europe and US and Japan and some of these other markets. But they are not reaching uh, patients in the rest of the world. Now, I think India has a very wonderful opportunity of addressing that need, okay? And we, for instance, as a company, have looked at that opportunity. We have looked at innovation coming out of the US, coming out of Cuba, coming out of many parts of the world. And we are saying, how do we use the India capability base, the India innovation base, to deliver these affordable drugs to the world? So for us, innovation is about global opportunities. But it is also about delivering those innovations to patients in India. That's a very important part of our uh, objective. Does, does that make you think, uh, is there a sort of, uh, does it make you look and get torn in two different directions to look at 
the global need versus the Indian need? Because that, that would be a question which would be uh, coming to your mind. You know, there are many, many approaches. I think you cannot really segment it into the only the India need or only the developing world need or only. You, when you look at some of these areas like cancer, like autoimmune diseases, like diabetes, these are global pandemic, you know, disease areas which I think the world is challenged with. But when you look at it in the context of India, I think India is the world's diabetic capital. India's, uh, you know, cancer population is growing at alarming levels. So it all becomes very, very, con you know, it, 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 it's very sort of uh, uh, important to look at India as not just a malaria, TB, AIDS kind of market, but I think it's also important to know that you have patients who are crying for this drug at affordable prices in all these d disease areas. So for us as a company, you know, you cannot afford to do all. I mean, every company chooses its niche, chooses its own area of uh, focus. We've decided to choose diabetes, oncology, and autoimmune disease as that focus. I think what is important about innovation is you have to map that innovation activity in terms of where do you do what? And I think if you stop looking at it as just the India opportunity and you start building partnering models which allow you to deliver this affordable innovation, the drug will do just as well here as it will do in any market. That's the way we look at it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mune, when I think the biggest endorsement of India's uh, capabilities in this sector was when they actually decided to partner with uh, Ranbaxi now. How do you see India, again, are you looking at the Indian market alone or do you look at Ranbaxi okay. catering to the rest of the world? I would like to answer to you in a different way. And uh, first of all, we have to learn, as I thank you, our Japanese have to learn more detail about India. We have a lot of interest and a lot of respect to India. And then, uh, when we talk about the healthcare business, for example, we have a lot of opportunity around the world. Because, you know, even uh, economical recession nowadays, healthcare business is a driving force of the economy of the 21st century. That is no question. Because patients waiting for drugs, better drugs, better product, better treatment. So that opportunity is big enough for the healthcare business. Especially, as she said, cancer is not satisfied yet. Diabetics, there are so many drugs, still there are a lot of spaces. So that we have a lot of space to fight with, with the innovation. And then when we define what is the innovation, I believe there is a diversity of innovation from the top of the science nowadays, and also what patients need on the better side. It's you know, so many diversity. That's why not necessarily only look for you know, top of the science, but have to look for what patient needs on the better side. So that another world is an innovation from the better side. That can be used as a common language throughout the world. And when I used to talk about imitation to innovation, when I was asked, I'm asked to be here on that paper. I just re remember about Japan. In the early days, if we can say Japan is now innovative enough, you know, many years ago, we are just, you know, announced as if we are imitator. That's true. But how we can change from imitator to innovator? I believe that is a proud at first. After World War II, we have a terrible time. All the body of Japan has destroyed. Even my generation, at the school, I was told Japan art is worse than, or less value than Western art. And all education coming in such a way, we almost losing the body of Japan. But basically, we keep the pride of Japan. That is most important how our ancestors are innovative in the past. Then uh, I believe, imitator to innovator, the proud is the first. You must proud of Indian history, 
then now uh, treat guys well. That is one. And secondly, in the pharmaceutical business especially, if we do not look for innovation, of course we can't contribute to the patient, but also we will have a big risk to maintain or grow the company under the condition without not so serious competition in the world. Imitator can survive, but in a competitive arena, we can't. So that in order to run the business healthy way, sound way, we need innovation. And third point I want to say, proud and also risk management as innovation. And the third point is alliance, partnership. No one can do innovation without partnership. So alliance, partnership, whatever the word is, second hand beyond the boundaries, beyond the companies, whatever, and even not pharmaceutical alone. New technology coming from outside for diagnosis or better you know, treatment. Good example is, uh, for example, I can say, if the food improved, then a diabetic drug future would be different. If the mattress improved, then the drugs for the, you know, some injury, those would be difficult. So that innovation come from all directions. If pharmaceutical believe we are only the innovator for the patient, it's totally wrong. So alliance beyond boundaries, alliance beyond the business type, that is the key for innovation. So the proud partnership and also risk management, that is all needs for innovation. Thank, Thank you. you. A critical issue of partnership which uh, Mr. Sibyl also raised between government and the industry. So I put this question to you, Mr. Bhatia. What has been the experience of Indian industry collaborating with government on this in this sector, and what changes would you like to see to, again, make sure that it leads to more improved results? Sorry, I couldn't follow your question well. You are talking about... Um, Please talk. Yes, I'm asking oh, Mr. Bhatia okay. about oh, sorry. this question. Sorry about it. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, before I, I deal with your question, let me delve a little bit about, you know, there's a lot said about how innovation does happen. Sure. Issue about partnership, etc. Where does, how does innovation happen, actually, in a, in a country? Uh, how does innovation happen? Uh, how do you build an ecosystem for innovation? And because innovation can never really happen on its own. If I decide that singly or my own company should become a great innovator, it can never happen. What you need is an ecosystem. So what do you need in an ecosystem? You need, firstly, you need high quality human resource. You need a very enlightened academia, you need investment in higher education, and if that comes investment in basic research, you need an IP framework, you need a government policy framework which supports innovation, which says we'll give you tax credit or, we'll be, or they will give enough grants for doing basic research. You need vendors, you need partners, you need risk capital. Don't forget that unless you have capital to take risk, either a venture capitalist or businesses or people who will say, I'm ready to bet on, on this innovation, then only people will start taking that risk. And I believe that ecosystem has evolved. The good news is that ecosystem has evolved. Look at Bangalore, look at Hyderabad, look at Delhi, look at Pune, there are many such clusters which has evolved. And you're starting to see innovation happen. I also want to make a point that in the last 10 years, the Indian industry to that extent has evolved quite a bit. There's a lot of talk about imitation to innovation. But I think imitation is, a, is a really a wrong word. You know, a generic industry gave the framework for innovation industry to happen. I think even in the generic industry, there was a huge amount of innovation in terms of how to bring the cost down to make the drugs affordable. And that created really the framework on which today we can say that we have a pharmaceutical industry. Because you have a pharmaceutical industry, you can, you can build innovation around it. 
You know, if I, if I look at my own company, 10 years back, we probably hired 10 scientists. Today we have 1,300 people doing research. And we, we partner, we, uh, we partner with academia, we partner with other companies because really, if you, if you really want to look at a breakthrough innovation, you cannot say that you know it all. Now the partnership framework works very well. They bring in their knowledge and expertise in that area. You bring in your knowledge and lo and behold, you have quickly a candidate. And of course, somebody said rightly that India is at a very early stage. Drug research, you have to see the results over 15 to 20 years. We are still on the R side, you know. We still have to look at the development side where you start going into clinical side to phase one, two, and three. It does take time. I think we are right in the middle of it. It is starting to happen. And we are starting to see even international academia. Uh, we recently agreed with, uh, I think Bob is here, we, we are partnering with Duke University even to look at how to bring their knowledge and our partnership today to see how we can add value together as, as two organizations. Kapil is here. You know, Kapil, we have issues like dengue, we have issues like HIV, uh, uh, we have uh, malaria and TB. So if you, if you, as a, you know, as a, as a government has invested almost in CSIR labs and <clears throat> independent labs under the in, uh, Ministry of uh, Biotechnology, we have more than 20, 25,000 people doing research. But I think we need to look at how these, re how these research that is happening in the government institutions, are they being translated into products which are coming into the market? One model, which I think the Australian government and some of the other governments have used is, is a partnership model, which a lot has been talked about. Take a program, let's say TB, that if you have to attack TB, come out with a new TB uh, drug, how do you bring in academia, uh, private companies, uh, your government institutions together into a program? You can give grant. Industry is ready to give research philanthropy. We are prepared to work. Just to, just to give you an example that today we have companies, international pharma companies, which are building network, where working on TB, where there are five different institutions are contributing their knowledge into, uh, into producing the product. So I think the age has come where in a, in a networked world, we can create a network institutional model to really solve some of these critical issues. And I think, uh, government has done a lot of work in, in terms of building grant uh, uh, or building policy. I think this is this network part, if you can build, will help a lot. Mr. Sibyl, would you like to respond also about the innovation which is taking place within the government space? How can that be best brought to... You know, again, I think it's not a question of innovation taking place within government space. You know, there can be no innovation in isolation. And I just want to respond to what you're saying about tuberculosis. In fact, we realize that this is an issue that we need to move forward on in a very big way. So CSIR launched what is called an open drug discovery platform, away from the, from the, the, the traditional model of IP. What we've done is we've, um, we've opened up a platform for anybody to, who wants to collaborate uh, to discover a new chemical entity in tuberculosis to come on board and to share their knowledge with us. And you can't imagine the kind of response that we have seen from across the world, from Japan to the United States, right? And it's not, well, I'm going to, not going to make money as we move along, but the, the new chemical entities, if we put our knowledge together, see, in a company, you may have 10 scientists, or in 10 companies, four companies working together, may, you may have 50 scientists. But if you have an open platform, you can have hundreds of people who you cannot access otherwise, who will come onto your platform and are willing to work with you. And once the new chemical entity is, is discovered, you can then share it with companies. And the companies can come on board. Uh, you know, the Gates Foundation can come on board and say, okay, we'll move forward. So we are in fact working in an entirely new, novel way to move forward in this direction because we need to innovate. This is just an example of innovation. Now we have within the ministry, and as Government of India policy, willing to go up to 100 crores 
as, 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 as loan or grant working with you to innovate in any field that you would want to. Previously, the amounts were minuscule, up to 10 crores, but we're willing to go up to 100 crores. So the government is extremely willing to move forward with the private sector. But you know, it's the market which is going to create the innovation solutions, because the conditions in the market will bring about the solutions, which, which will be through innovation. Now, the market in India, as you know, there's going to be 5 lakh crores need to be invested in the healthcare sector by 2020. 5 lakh crores. You can imagine the opportunities available. And, and the market is going to be attracted to those opportunities. You know, it's only the, a very small percentage of the Indian population which has access to drugs. A large part of it is served by traditional medicine. So we need to access those markets. The insurance sector is, is going to go, uh, grow by 35,000 crores in a few years from now. How do you reach people? A very small percentage of our people are insured. We are young today as a nation, but say 30 years from now, all these young people will be in their 60s. So you need a huge in investment in insurance. And that's the market opportunity. You will then have new business models which will, through innovation, serve those market opportunities. Mr. Alexander, do you sometimes see uh, a situation where when the government and the private sector work together, there's a bit of a dissonance in, in terms of what the private sector wants to cater to the market and what the government wants to take care of from the social perspective. Do you see that as, as a point of a bit of friction? No, that would not generally be my experience. I think the challenge is having an effective dialogue to better understand the needs and requirements of both government and the private sector. Quite often the analogy that is used to describe the challenge in health uh, or in other uh, sectors such as health is to say it's like the moonshot in America during the 1960s, that the government should work with the private sector and decide that the equivalent of we're going to put a man on the moon and I understand quite how topical an issue space programs are in India this month of all. But I actually think that's quite a bad analogy for what we want to see within the health sector in the sense that I would not want to see a program with a limited number of researchers with cost being no constraint, as was the case with NASA in the 1960s in the United States. I would want thousands of innovators right across India, each trying to find a way forward. Some will fail inevitably with good research and good entrepreneurial skills notwithstanding. But on the other hand, we need the dynamism and innovation of the market first to come up with new products and then to be able to distribute them effectively. And that's why I think the role of government in this sector is actually enabling. Now in our case in the United Kingdom, similarly we've put in place research and development tax credits. Uh, we're looking at how we can improve market information so that the price signals that people are reading can be judged accurate and will themselves incentivize innovation. And also people are looking for guaranteed markets in the future. So I think there's a great deal, whether in terms of information or in terms of market certainty, that governments can do along with some of the issues of financial incentives that we've been discussing. Let me just, I want to just intervene here. Harry, you mentioned the question about human resource. Now we're doing a wonderful project with the Wellcome Trust, mm. the largest project outside, out of the United Kingdom, in which we have gone into a partnership for about 10 years, and each of us, the ministry and Welcome Trust is going to contribute 8 million pounds each year. So at the end of 10 years, you'll have 80 million pounds contributed by both sides, only to build world-class, high-quality human resource, because without that, you cannot get innovation. So this is yet another partnership which is innovative in nature with the objective in mind that you must produce those kind of people who will then fuel innovation. Thanks. Uh I'd like to open the question to the floor. Uh, do identify yourself, and uh, if you'd like, do mention who would like the questions to be answered by. The gentleman there, right in the center. Good evening. My name is uh, Jean-François de la Bison. I am working for a French company called Merieux Alliance, and we are present in India now for about two, 15 years. Two comments. The first one is uh, I am the president of the European Diagnostic Association, and uh, we have a lot of difficulties to find uh, uh, and to try to set up collaboration with the Indian uh, Diagnostic Association. Then it's a request that I make there. We are there and I'm convinced that in the field of health, we need to work all together 
We have strong collaboration with the US. We have strong collaboration with Japan. I think we need to have strong collaboration with India, and that's an occasion for me to make that appeal. The second point is coming back to TB. Uh, I am member of the board of the Stop TB Partnership, which is hosted by the World Health Organization, in which we are working very closely with the World Economic Forum, and I am representing the private sector. We have a very important meeting in Seattle next June on multi-drug resistance and tuberculosis. And I, want, I should like very much to have Indian companies present in such organization. And for me, what I want to underline is many times we have uh, meetings, international meetings on health where American companies, European companies, Japanese companies are very present. And I think that knowing now India for a long time, I'm sure that you have very cap capable companies in India who should have to be present in this meeting in Seattle. Then coming back to TB, I just want to make the information to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to react to that, uh, Ms. Shaw? I, well, I think it's, uh, it's a good uh, announcement that he's made, and I think Indian companies must certainly be there. And I think that's, again, what we need to do. We need to raise our profile in these kind of forums, because I think the only uh, point I'd like to make is that India is often, uh, you know, we, there's a twin tack approach that we need to all address in terms of delivering affordable health care. One is through the quote unquote imitation route, which is the generics market. And then there's the innovation route, which is really about addressing some of these unmet needs, you know, like, like the gentleman just mentioned. So I think TB is certainly an area where India needs to focus very strongly. And I'm I think it's vital that we start raising our profile at these forums. Thank you. Any other question, please? Right, so I guess I'll take the next question. Uh, we, have, we have not really discussed healthcare services. Uh, we've seen a lot of innovation and excellent services from healthcare companies. Now, where do you see that going? I'd like to ask Nalvinder to respond to that. We have three or four good companies who are delivering good services, uh, but we don't see a lot of new ventures coming in this field. How do you see this industry developing? Well, I think in the past, uh, really, if you look at the healthcare industry, uh, there's been this notion that, look, healthcare in India should be free and it should not be for profit. Uh, but I think clearly today there's a very significant demand supply gap in terms of having the kind of healthcare infrastructure that one would need in any city. So forget getting into uh, a semi-urban or a rural sector, but even if you look at the urban cities, if you look at, say, uh, you know, our own city in Delhi, uh, we don't have adequate facilities or capable facilities where you would, you know, feel comfortable to walk in. And today when you walk in, there is a significant waiting line uh, for you to do what you need to do. Uh, so I think there is, uh, there, and there has been, I would say a significant increase in investment in the healthcare sector, but clearly we are sitting on the tip of the iceberg and there is a lot more that needs to happen. In healthcare today, uh, you need to be located centrally and therefore the cost of land is certainly uh, you know, an expensive proposition to work upon. Uh, but uh, there is a high upfront expenditure in terms of the capital allocation you would do, and there is a gestation period of around seven to eight years before you can actually make money uh, on any significant size hospital. So I think uh, there needs to be more investment. People are putting in the investment. And as you would look five to ten years from today, I certainly see this to be uh, a lot more corporatized in terms of a sector versus where we are today. Uh, there are not many uh, you know, institutional players as organizations who are actually uh, investing that kind of money today. But Why is that? But, Why is that? but because of the viability and the gestation. And at the same point in time, uh, what I would say is today it's a lot more than what it was five or seven years ago. And if you look ahead, uh, I think there will be a lot more investment, but I think we need to recognize that there is going to be a significant capital expenditure that such projects have. And if you look at the prices uh, at which these services and treatments are available in India, it is extremely competitive. So I think today the industry is trying to create a viable model on the one hand of making sure you have good global infrastructure, you've got the best capabilities, we have very experienced doctors in India, but the price point at which the services and and everything you need from a healthcare perspective is extremely, extremely competitive. So if you look at the next 5, 10, 15 years, I certainly see a lot more happening. 
As a priority, I think the industry will probably focus more on the urban sectors because that's where the economic uh, model is more viable. And as that happens, then it will penetrate down. And I think technology today will play a critical role in trying to speed up this entire process. And you don't need to be building brick and mortar everywhere of the same size, but really leveraging technology uh, you know, in a far more effective manner than what was available in the past. Mr. Bharti, when can uh, private healthcare reach the masses, or should it at all look at the masses? Absolutely. You know, in fact, there are very interesting experiments going on in the private sector. Uh, we were privy to one yesterday, and I know of three or four very interesting models in the rural area or small town models that are starting to evolve, where you are looking at delivering affordable healthcare, <coughs> good quality affordable healthcare at very low prices. Uh, Jubilant itself is involved in, in doing a big experiment in West Bengal where we are setting up hub and spoke model for only middle class and the lower middle class to, to provide health care at low costs. Just to give you an idea, we did an experiment with uh, one of the hospitals in Bahrampur, which is a very small town, very rural town in West Bengal, where the per bed charges are, are $5 you know, per, per night and the, in the intensive care charges are $15 per night, and which in any standard is quite low. And the, of the quality of care that you provide there is, is very good and very reasonable. And the similar experiments are being done in, in Andhra Pradesh, near Bangalore. There's a, there's a company I, I, I met called Vatsalya, which is doing very small hospitals of 25 beds, and they plan to build hundreds of that. So, and now there are technology being used like telemedicine where somebody has developed a device where you can, uh, a healthcare worker who's not, doesn't have to be a doctor, is able to take the basic readings from a person which is blood pressure, uh, heart, heart sound, and even blood. They are developing a special chip device where you could test the blood and the results could go to the doctor and then he could prescribe the medicine. So, and this is experiments on the ground and all private sector, and that's the interesting part. So a lot of, I think in the next five to six years, you'll find a lot of interesting things happening in this area. Mr. Sibal, would you like to talk about how private healthcare seems to be setting a new benchmark for healthcare in the country? We have seen that government has not been very efficient, perhaps because of the sheer volume of people who are at uh, the doorstep of government hospitals. How can government and private sector work better on healthcare? Well, this is really one of the most complex issues. That you have about seven, eight hundred million people who earn less than two dollars a day. I mean, you can't expect them to get quality healthcare. So I think part of the problem is poverty. So we need to actually continue to have nine percent growth for the next ten years, for them to have more money in their pockets, for them then to access the system that can be put in place. And in the meantime, we need to increase our contribution from 1% to GDP to 3% to GDP in the same period of time. Then we can think of the kind of partnerships that you're talking about. But I think, yes, as an experiment, things are going on in Bangalore, um, uh, things are going on in Delhi. And, uh, but what we need to do is that if we need to leapfrog to solutions, we need to ride on the shoulder of information technology. I think it's the IT sector which will connect everybody, and it's high technology solutions which will ride on the IT sector. And um, telemedicine is one, diagnostics is another, and I think that if we can actually combine all that and leapfrog into providing solutions, because I think the future of the world depends on giving healthcare, instead of having people come to hospitals, healthcare should reach people. And I think we need to innovate there as to how to make healthcare reach people. We need to build a huge infrastructure across the country, and that's really the, the task of the state, and we intend to do that. Minister Alexander, the NHS, of course, is, is an example of how healthcare has been delivered in many ways. Of course, it has its flaws, and I'm sure you faced a lot of criticism on that, but is there a model where government can actually work in an efficient manner in healthcare delivery? Well, I would strongly advocate from the United Kingdom's point of view, the, the model that we have as being appropriate to our circumstances. If you look at the amount of money that is spent 
on healthcare in the United Kingdom and compare it with the kind of premiums that employers are obliged to pay in the United States, we would strongly argue that we've seen great efficiencies delivered through having national and public provision of healthcare. There's great um, speculation at the moment in relation to General Motors in the United States, and that was the subject of much discussion in the newspapers at the weekend. One of the difficulties that General Motors struggles with is the high cost of healthcare it's having to provide for its own employees, and yet still in the United States where there's been extraordinary innovation in the health sector, there are many millions of people without health insurance. So there are equity arguments as well as efficiency arguments that I think are relevant, but I would very much concur with the Minister's view that it's difficult to disaggregate the issue of health from other basic social and human rights, and in that sense, the development path that India has set on, which has seen huge and significant strides in recent years, I think inevitably and appropriately will also involve the health sector. One other point that I would make, though, I think the health sector can make a contribution to exports and to GDP as well as being able to sure. address the needs of the Indian population. If you look at the kind of changes that have taken place off the back of the IT sector in recent years, India is already moving dramatically from low value added clerical services to much higher added value services like accountancy and legal services. Sure. And there is no doubt also in terms of diagnostics that there's real opportunities for highly trained and skilled Indian specialists and physicians to be able to make a contribution to global medicine off the back of the kind of connected world that we now live in, in which we can not only compete but also collaborate effectively. We have a question on the floor, um, Mr. Singh. Uh, uh, this question is really directed at the two ministers uh, on the dais. Uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time, I think, talking about the, uh, the uh, challenges on the curative side of healthcare, uh, all that is required on the cure side. And the fact that I think the world has not done enough on the preventive side for the last 50 years is part of the reasons why you've got General Motors likely to uh, face uh, collapse and many, many other systems likely to face collapse. There hasn't been enough and creative and effective work done on prevention on, on public health initiative. And I would urge that the ministers should clearly look at spending a lot more money effort in the public health arena oh, and, and in this uh, one to three percent increase which I think is is very very necessary should go in the preventive side now that doesn't take away from the fact that we will require huge capacity huge investment on the curative side but if we don't if we don't uh, do equally powerful work on the preventive side and on the public health side I suspect that the challenge will become completely impossible to handle ministers well, you know, I entirely agree with you, and that's really the way forward. And quite frankly, uh, let me just share something very interesting with you. Um, in the last two, three years, we've done a survey of, because India, as you know, has diverse population, um, diverse uh, racial um, um, stocks. And what we've done is we've, um, through genomics, we have actually segregated uh, populations across the country um, and figured out which section of the population is susceptible to which disease. And we've done a map of that. Now, if you want your uh, immunization program, or your vaccination program, you don't have to need to vaccinate all the children in, uh, in India for, for, for a particular disease because you know this population is immune from this disease. So you're, you can reduce your costs of the vaccination program. And then through genomics, you can develop a healthcare target strategy which is preventive in nature. And the ministry, CSIR in particular, is doing huge amounts of work. In fact, the way forward, I think, is genomics. And once we move forward in that direction, uh, I think uh, preventive medicine will be more important than curative medicine. Uh, we'll ask Mr. Alexander, would you like to react? I, don't, I'll ask I, to Mr. I don't mean to disappoint, but I agree with you as well. Um, from a British point of view, I think our risk is that we have developed an illness service and not a health service. Because actually we are developing new cures, we are developing new treatments. But if you look at the big health challenges that we're going to face in Britain in the years to come, if you look at something like the rise of obesity within Britain uh, and the follow-on diseases of childhood diabetes and many other challenges that we are facing at the moment, then 
no government system, however well funded, can take the place of fundamental and very personal changes in terms of lifestyle. And in that sense, uh, there are cultural factors at work here as well as the interaction between the individual and the state. But it is very much the focus of our work. I was at the British government cabinet meeting only on Tuesday and we were discussing exactly this issue. Uh, I think the difficulty is all too often the public health sector has been the Cinderella sector of healthcare. People are keen to put money into uh, advanced treatments, into acute health services, into hospitals, when actually the development, certainly in Britain, has been towards an ever greater delivery of services at the community level, partly on the back of the kind of connectivity that we've been discussing. The ability to make the general practitioner, the, phys the physician within the community, uh, where you're able to undertake minor surgery, where you're able to receive vaccinations, treatments that would only previously have been available at a major health service uh, and at a hospital. So in that sense, I think it makes sense for our delivery of health care, but it also recognizes with humility that there are certain challenges which unless we address as public health challenges, potentially risk much greater burdens on the National Health Service in the years to come. Mr. Termia, you wanted to react. Yeah, I, I wanted to divide uh, uh, your very, very correct comment into two parts um, uh, in the future, and, and it may apply in India, it may be way too late in the West to think this way. Um, there is a wellness activity, which is not healthcare. It has to do with wellness. And it should develop into an industry. It should develop into a creative, innovative industry not regulated, not limited by all the different ways that the other part of the industry is regulated appropriately so, but driven to create wellness in populations. That includes environmental issues and all kinds of others. It includes in particular education and education and education. And then there is the other part, which has clocked up healthcare in the West, which is uh, the curative part. We didn't take care of wellness, so we ended up with having the cure. And there, we got clocked up by uh, the, the difficulty of trial and error medicine. We, we don't know what works. So we try all kinds of stuff. And some stuff doesn't work at all. So people are handheld into, uh, finally, um, uh, not, not, not curing at all. And uh, as a result, these programs became employment programs. In, in the, I live in Massachusetts in the United States, in Cambridge. Massachusetts had six million people in the state. 460,000 of these people are employed in healthcare. You do that ratio in this country. And when something happens, a breakthrough, and we try to reduce the healthcare, investment in terms of people. It creates unemployment for that group. So the resistance is quite significant. It's, it, it's, it's in all kinds of different corners. And uh, we need to avoid here that healthcare becomes an employment program. <coughs> we need to figure out ways to focus on wellness in the educational sense. Don't reimburse it, because once you reimburse it, it blows up. You need to really say, it makes sense. Don't get ill and focus in the greatest innovative, global, cooperative way to figure out effective cures, apply the best diagnosis so that we can match diagnosis with a cure that works and stop trial and error medicine. We have time for about two questions, Mr. Bajaj. Yes, is the mic coming to you? Uh, question is to Minister uh, Sibyl. Uh, how well have you leveraged insurance uh, to bridge the gap between affordability and the actual capability? Uh, <clears throat> Malvinder talked about going from $500 to $50. Very good. But $50 is also unaffordable by the millions who are below a dollar a day or two dollars a day earning capacity. So. Uh, groups of people, groups of villages could be insured. And uh, have you tried that model and taken insurance in your radar? We've done some insurance in the BPL sector, uh, but uh, certainly not uh, developed models. 
through the state uh, for, for spreading insurance uh, in the fashion that you have suggested. But I think that's the challenge for the private industry, that how does the private industry get together people uh, to make products of that nature which allow people with, uh, with, with, with uh, moderate capacities or, 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 or small capacities to pay and yet uh, in Delhi, for example, we are trying an experiment very hard in my own constituency where I want, say, every member of the family to contribute 10 rupees and say if you have a lack of people, then 10 rupees per month is not much and that way they can actually be treated up to 30,000 rupees in any, in any accident. But you need a, a, a one lakh people to contribute to make it economically viable. But I think that needs to be developed by the private sector. It can't be done by the state. Uh, by the NGOs, by the yes, by insurance the sector? Yes, yes, insurance sector, NGOs. I think there are a number of such schemes already have, have, which have taken root. I think the Andhra Pradesh government has yes. you know, taken a lot of these micro-insurance programs to many, many villages. In Karnataka, we ourselves are involved with a number of micro-insurance programs. But I think uh, you need to scale it up. I think that's the challenge. We can do it in the sort of the semi-urban areas through this hub and spoke approach because you need a anchor hospital that then operates through other clinics. But what really is a big challenge is as you go into the hinterland, you don't have that anchor hospital, it's too far away. So I think that's the kind of challenges that we have in this insurance space and which we need to address differently. One more point I wanted to make was that we keep talking, you know, this whole discussion we are having seems to be centered around drugs, but I think innovation and imitation is about many other aspects. The insurance model also needs to be very innovative. We shouldn't just be imitating and doing a cut and paste jobs of other, you know, you know, other insurance models. I know that there are some very innovative compliance-based, uh, you know, insurance models that have come up in disease management. You know, ICICI came up with a very interesting compliance-based diabetes insurance model. It didn't quite take off the way it should because I think that model needs to be better understood. But these are the exciting opportunities that we have in the insurance sector, in how do you create hospitals, how do you create hub and spoke approaches, how do you uh, get into diagnostics. I think diagnostics is a very interesting opportunity uh, and so on and so forth. So I think innovation has to be across that healthcare sector. But you shouldn't develop models which ultimately end up giving subsidies. Yeah. Because then what happens is that then it will not work. So what we need is to develop those products which are not subsidized but which are economically viable. And that we need partnerships, NGOs, private sector, you know, insurance companies to come out with those products. Uh, we have one question, uh, Mr. Shivinder Singh and then the gentleman at the back. So please give the mic to him. Good evening. This is Shivinder from Fortis Healthcare. Uh, yeah, I think the subject you're talking about in delivery is very close to my heart. Uh, this is partly addressed to Mr. Sibyl, not by individual, but by being part of the government. Uh, and I'm looking for a response in terms of a perspective whether it's possible, and I know the government's time frame is a little short. Uh, in my mind, uh, that there's a triangle approach that we need to adopt for healthcare delivery, which is access, affordable, and reliable. So accessibility, affordability, and reliability. Today in the country, accessibility is created by the government network of hospitals and primary centers. Affordability largely comes in through NGOs by virtue of charitable hospitals, and reliability comes in with private corporate enterprises. This model is, is tripartite but working in different directions, and which is why I think we have an issue in the country where our healthcare system doesn't work. I think if you look at you know, all the healthcare expenditure that, you, that we're doing as a government today, 1.2%, 1, 1 uh, and the ambition of taking it to 2 to 3%, if we're able to just take all that money and ensure, like, uh, Ms. Shaw talked about uh, the micro-insurance model and actually ensure the bottom half of our population with all the national and state government healthcare expenditure. I think it will be far better utilization of money uh, and then you allow partnerships to happen between the government, the NGOs and the private sector to actually create the access and create reliability and then bring in regulation for the government to ensure that the citizens are being taken care of. I don't think the government spending more money and it getting diluted down the value chain 
uh, and just hoping for insurance and private sector to come up will actually be a solution because the private sector doesn't have a model in the health insurance sector today because it's all cross-subsidized, so there's an, it's not going to happen. Uh, and the corporate sector, like Malvinda said, will only stick to urban environments because it has a large congregation of people and therefore has a viable business model. I think this way the business model can actually fill it to go to tire to tire three, tire four cities. But the problem is that um, in a federal structure, as you know, that healthcare is a state subject. So the central government doesn't drive healthcare. We can give money under schemes of the government of India, but we can't set up healthcare centers in the state because that's not our job. It has to be done by the state government. And this is why you find disparate levels of development in many states in this country where healthcare systems in some states are exceptional. In some states they are very poor because ultimately it's the priority of the state and the revenues of the state and the prosperity of the state. So you cannot have a national model which can be actually put in place and implemented at the level of the state and at the level of the district. And that's an impossible thing to do. So we expect the state governments to move forward in that direction. And we are willing at the central government level and at the federal level to give any support that we can give under schemes and under particular projects and programs. That's why we're trying to build centers of excellence throughout the country because that's what we can do uh, as the Union of India. But we can't be build primary health centers for them. So we need actually the state governments to move forward in that direction. One final question from the gentleman. Please identify yourself. Rich Kothari from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Uh, we've rightly identified the importance of prevention. And I can imagine that any innovation in prevention will cut across several ministries. Ministry of Human Resource Development, Department of Education, Information Broadcasting, Health Ministry, and probably many other ministries. And how do you collaborate across ministries uh, because I have faced this problem in the past where getting to talk to two ministries is very difficult. <laughs> so in an, to, to promote innovation, how do you do uh, across ministries? And this is a question to uh, the minister. Well, you know, I can, I can tell you this, that though I am not in healthcare, I mean, I am in science and technology, but uh, we work very, very um, um, strongly with the Ministry of, of, uh, of Health. For example, take our stem cell research program today. Now stem cell, both the science and technology ministry and the health ministry are involved, which is the ICMR. We jointly actually have now set out the guidelines for stem cell research. We work very closely with the ministry of HRD in the context of education, which Henry was talking about, uh, because I don't think that we, so there are now, I have set up permanent committees, inter-ministerial permanent committees for the kind of collaborations that you are talking about so that the process of collaboration becomes much easier. I have secretary level people actually meet every month to look at issues with that impact both ministries. I'll take the last question. Actually, I won't sum up, but a basic question which I think we haven't addressed is of talent and uh, the lack of it or the need for it. So I would like each of you to tell us how we can best invest in talent which will drive growth, innovation in this industry and what each of you are doing in that field. If I could begin with Mr. Bhartia. You know, uh, talent-wise for innovation, uh, one of the things that, that I personally believe that we need to invest in is to make sure that our larger institutions like colleges do not only produce undergraduates but continue to produce postgraduates. And that's where investment is required, either research fellowships, so that you seduce people not to take a job but to to be in research. And so we, we work with institutions to say that, look, can you, uh, can you retain the good talent to be on the research side? Because it's not as paying as getting a job in the, in the company. Unisan, how would Daichi contribute to talent? Contribute to education or innovation, what you say? To talent, to growing talent for the future. Pardon? Okay, and uh, basically, we Japanese invest a lot of money for the education in academia, and then uh, nowadays, so many top age sciences are needed, as he said, stem cell research, and uh, those are 
only in a, a very difficult to do only in a single academia or a single institute. So that uh, in order to have a better talent, consortium type alliance is necessary throughout Japan or even uh, second with foreign countries. So that basic science, you now people have a basis in that is uh, as a uh, lab research very much. And how to enhance, how to encourage their interest is to build a consortium to work together. Then uh, as I said, as someone said, prevention is now so important. And then uh, how to prevent the disease, not to get a disease. Then uh, genomics help a lot. So now, many, many types of science are now available. How to integrate it together? That is a driving force. I believe the government must take action. And also, industry can participate in such program. Then I think a better science can be achieved for the patient for prevention or treatment. Kiranji? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the one of the problems we've had, I think, is that we've tended to go about our education programs in a very silo-like manner. So I think we've tended to segregate research institutions, training institutions, colleges, universities as training institutions, and then research labs is just purely focused on research. Medical colleges are just training institutes, not research institutes. And I think what we, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Sibyl has taken this big initiative of saying, why can't we make sure that our research institutes also offer uh, training, you know, and, and sort of graduate programs? I think it's, it's a waste of a resource if we have research institutes without any teaching component or without any training component. So I think that's the kind of thing we are trying to do in terms of bringing about transformational change in the way we are going about our human resource development. We have 40 national labs. They're only focusing on research. Actually, that's a very valuable resource for getting people into a research-oriented educational program. So we must have graduate programs, teaching programs in those institutes, and so on and so forth. Thank you. MD, PhD programs, you know, that's something which we are all focusing on very strongly because I think um, the medical colleges have only focused on MD programs and haven't focused on research, so we're trying to see how do you bring about these kind of changes. Mr. Demi? Yeah, in, in terms of India, I, my comments have to be uh, limited given where we are right now, but uh, what Kieran just brings up is such an incredible opportunity. Um, and uh, you know, the, the tra transaction we did today on malaria, where uh, working with I. CGEB, um, uh, they have 123 students, um, smart students, very smart students indeed, and I met some of them, and it is magnificent, and uh, it is very easy to develop that relationship, and, and you become involved at a different level almost immediately. And this we do throughout the world, uh, finding ways to combine it. Uh, I was not aware that it wasn't as common here, and I think it is an opportunity that I hope will open up. Another place where uh, maybe a company like ours has some impact, uh, also I want to be careful about its, its size, is we have about um, 15 out of 2,000 people focused on R&D within the company, and they are very much focused in Cambridge and the, uh, with MIT and Harvard and in Cambridge and the uh, University of Cambridge in the UK, and very closely connected to those institutions. And there are many Indian scientists uh, as part of it. And uh, as part of us trying to understand how we become part and integrate ourselves within the Indian environment so that we can make a contribution to it, um, those uh, talents, <coughs> fantastic talents, became very important and will always be very important for us. Uh, so that, that is a an, an, uh, far away resource that uh, I think is tremendously powerful. Thank you, Mr. Tibbet. I don't think we can really develop talent, talent in India unless we free the, the education sector from bureaucratic control. We need to get FDI in the education sector because you can just imagine the kind of energy uh, that is present in this country with... And your government will push for that? Well, we are trying very hard within government to push for it. 
and um, you know we have a group of ministers and that was cleared in the group of ministers uh, the left was opposing it at one point in time of course now elections are around the corner so i don't know but i think that in the next six eight months or ten months whichever government comes to power this is going to happen and i think without that we cannot encourage uh, you know talent in this country that's number one two is that we need to make our education system multidisciplinary you know we need to bring botanists biologists chemical engineers information technology engineers and together and we need to make, make have those institutions set being set up three we need skill development in this country vocational training and skill development and that of course includes the medical and healthcare sector and four we need to encourage school going children remember the hallmark of any developed society is that for every million people there must be between 4 to 7000 people doing r&d if you have a society for every million people 4 to 7000 do r&d you're you're going to be a developed country okay in india that number is 150 156 so i think we have a long way to go that's the real challenge thank you minister my travels suggest to me that talent is fairly evenly distributed in this world. It's simply opportunities which are not uh, distributed for that talent to be realized. So I would concur with much of what the minister has said. I think it's about, in the first instance, investing in basic primary education to give people basic skills. And again, if you look around the developing world, the weight of advantage is heavily skewed against young girls. And in that sense, if you want to see the biggest economic return, then educate young girls. And I know that in many parts of India that is happening. So I think in that sense, basic primary education. Secondly, I think we have learned in recent years in Britain, it is vital to get the interface between higher education and industry right. Because while it is important to have outstanding institutes of higher education, like your uh, technology institutes here, we also need to make sure that that interface with the commercial sector as has happened so effectively in MIT and Harvard and Stanford and elsewhere is put in place. So I think we need a high level of skills and expertise in our higher education sector, but they also be porous with the uh, industrial sector. And thirdly, we need a culture of lifelong learning within our businesses because it is going to be the skills and talents uh, by which profits are going to be generated more in this century than in the last century. There is going to be more mind jobs and less muscle jobs. So in that sense, I think my prescription would be get basic education right, make sure the interface between higher and uh, commercial uh, businesses is correct, and then ensure that you instill a culture of learning within those organizations. And that makes for a pretty strong prescription on which to harness the talent that is undoubtedly there. Thank you. Well, well I think I tend to agree with both the ministers in terms of what they've been talking about. But I think whatever is happening today between <coughs> industry and academia, and also between industry and the government seems to be you know, a very incremental gain every time you look at doing something. So I certainly believe that it's, uh, it's time we look at something radically different and also doing it in a manner which is far more efficient and far more quicker than the usual way of kind of you know, creating fresh capacity. Thanks very much uh, to the panelists. Clearly, we're in a very good position. India is in a great position to be an innovator in healthcare services. And as uh, Ms. Shaw was saying, not just in medicines, but also the delivery systems. Partnership within the domestic industry between international companies and Indian companies, as well as the government and the industry. I think that's the key. Between both of them, the industry and the government, strong investment in talent that would ensure that India does reach what its destiny is in healthcare. Thank you for joining us.